How does a 16-year-old girl under SIF's supervision wind up in the hands of a convicted rapist? It's a question that's plagued a young Taranaki woman for 10 years. She now lives with HIV and the knowledge that she's passed the virus on to one of her sons. She's found the strength to demand that no one else ends up being treated the way she was. Carly Himmelpo has her story. I was a typical teenager that wanted to go out with my mates and wanted to go and party <laughs> and have fun. But fun times soon turned to crime, family group conferences and youth court. To protect her identity, we'll call her Joanne. She's 27 years of age now and has a partner and two sons. She openly admits she was no angel growing up. At the age of 16, she was involved in a vicious beating and was charged with kidnapping, assault and robbery. It would have life-changing repercussions. I remember being arrested, I think I was held in a cell and that, had to go to court, had a conference with SIFS and family and then I was sent away to Kingsley residence down in Christchurch. So I was down there for three months I think it was. Come back, my parents didn't want me home, I didn't want to go home so it was another you know, family group conference of SIFS and that to work out where I would be placed. And then I was sent to live with an uncle out of town. As a result of the family group conference, Joanne moved from Taranaki to her father's brother's house in Tauranga. For a time, things were actually looking up. A new place, new friends, a fresh start. Everything seemed fine, we got along well. Started school, it was just like a normal family home. Mm. When did things start? Going on. I'd probably say about a month after being there, things started happening. Him coming into my room at night and doing stuff. Yeah, just the inappropriate behaviour started. Um, at first I freaked out, like I just sort of, I didn't have any reaction, my body just went numb and then I just yeah, didn't know what to do about it. And then one day I suppose I just had enough. It went on for a few weeks and then he freaked out and thought I was going to say something because um, we got into an argument. He actually got hold of my counsellor and that first before I did and made up the story that um, he had been asleep and he didn't realise what he had done. He was, I don't know, sleepwalking or sleep acting or whatever and he would kissed me. Sif's files confirm his confession. Joanne and her uncle, whom she was boarding with at the time, had been watching he videos. He attempted to kiss her and touch her. There were also notes Joanne about her attempted suicide. Joanne had knife cuts all up her left arm, from her wrist to her elbow. Joanne says she went along with his story and didn't reveal she had been allegedly raped, not only by him, but also by one of his friends. Sif sent her back to Taranaki, and while police took a statement, their investigation went nowhere. By this stage, Joanne was suicidal and under pressure from her family not to press charges. Older family members, aunties and that got in touch with me, talking to me, telling me it was my fault and that I needed to say this and say that. So I ended up not speaking out the truth then about that I was actually getting sexually abused. In my own mind, I started blaming myself. So I thought it was all my fault. I need to shut up and not say anything. Yeah, otherwise I'm going to get him in trouble for something I made happen. And yet the rape allegations shouldn't have come as a surprise to the family because they knew that Joanne's uncle was a convicted rapist. It was here that he was sentenced to six years for his part in one of New Zealand's most heinous pack rape crimes. The question is, why didn't SIFs know this and why didn't they do a criminal check before Joanne went to live with him? I didn't know at the time that he was a convicted rapist. Everyone in that room knew. <laughs> but I didn't know. I'd never been told growing up. My family that were there knew, knew of the history and the accusations. Do you think to yourself, how could you have let that happen? Yep, I don't understand as a parent myself. I would never, yeah, I'd never let that happen. Is that something you still think today? It's like, how the yep. hell could you... Yeah, I still struggle to deal with it. I have my moments. I try to let it go and carry on. And it was like the family tried to forget about that he was a convicted rapist, but what's sad for me is that's now become the same thing with my younger brothers. They're like, oh, well, it doesn't really matter, it's not a big deal. 
Um, and I d they don't see that they're passing that on because of the way the family are about it. It's like hush, hush, not spoken about and it's, yeah, okay, all right, move on, get over it. But Joanne's family background was overlooked as well. The parents' sifts were trying so hard to keep Joanne with also had a record. Her own mother and father were both convicted in the mid-90s of assaulting a five-year-old boy with a shovel and a wooden stick. Letting Joanne down is possibly their biggest regret. How do your parents feel about what has happened to you? She's still real sorry she didn't do anything more or prevent it from happening, but it's the way it turned out. You know, they, they live with guilt and regret. But what about SIF's part in all of this? I spoke with Joanne's former SIF's caseworker and she said while she's sorry for what happened to Joanne, she said she wasn't legally obligated to vet her uncle. She said her only role was to ensure that Joanne complied with the supervision order set out by the youth court. Last year Joanne prompted SIF's to investigate her case and while they offered her counselling, they refused to take responsibility for not vetting her uncle, saying they did everything by the book. I thought that was one of the first things they're meant to do and if they had, it would have popped up with this history and there's no way someone with that history should get any care of a child. No way, no matter how you end up involved with SIFs, you need to do checks but um, yeah, if you end up in there through the courts, they don't have to. What do you think about that? Oh, I think that's crazy. You know, that, so children could go to anybody, you know, pretty much. Go get them to a murderer or, you know. Joanne's still facing major challenges. She believes she contracted HIV when she was allegedly raped by her uncle's friend, who has since died of AIDS. She didn't realise she was HIV positive until her first son was born carrying the disease. I've been declared unfit to work. Um, I've also been declared unfit to be, um, what do you call it, like my children's full-time caregiver. My partner's had to stop working and become our caregiver, mine as well as the children's, you know. But nobody seems to see that either because we struggle, and, but it's based on the health and everything that's happened. What do you want? And to make sure that those rules are changed and every, you know, police checks and proper checks are done into people that are going to be looking after children. I want an apology. <laughs> You know, um, it'd be nice to get help as well. Yeah, I can't work, I'm not allowed to medically. But every day, even for myself, I live with guilt because of, and I know I shouldn't say it, but I say it all the time because he's sick because of me. Of course, we asked the Ministry of Social Development to come on to discuss this story, and we got this statement. In it, Deputy Chief Executive David Shanks admits SIFS let Joanne down, saying she should never have gone to live with an uncle who was a convicted rapist, and they're very sorry this happened to her. His statement goes on. In 2001, it wasn't mandatory for SIF staff to do criminal checks around family placement decisions made at youth justice family group conferences. This was a gap in SIF policy. Staff at the time were still, however, expected to assess the caregiver's suitability. In hindsight, it appears we didn't do a good enough job around this and we let her down. David Shanks says SIFS is re-examining its decision-making around Joanne's placement, but he's assuring the public SIFS policies have changed. Early this year, it became mandatory to do criminal checks for these placements. A range of other safety checks are now also required, including home visits. Now, we asked Minister of Social Development Paula Bennett why it had taken so long for checks to become mandatory. Look, I think that vetting caregivers um, should be and is mandatory. Uh, we are, Only you know, just though. Yeah, well, that's a change that has come about because we've really looked at how it should be. Equally, After 20 years though? Yeah, but equally there are cases where um, it's not child, youth and family that are placing the young people. You know, it is the families themselves. And at some level we do need to look at that all of community, that all of whānau, care and look out for that young person. So I, I can't make a call on who is to blame and who is responsible because it's operational and I'm not across the actual details of this particular case. But I would say we've all got a role in looking out for these kids. 
As for the young woman at the heart of this story, she's over the moon at finally receiving an apology, but it's just a shame she had to come to us to get it. You can view the full SIF statement on our website.